Aloha and welcome to this whirlwind tour of software development process models. The idea in this screencast is we're going to quickly go over four of the, I think, you know, the most important process models um, of the last 50 years. <laughs> uh, and, or I should say that they're kind of archetypal canonical process models. Um, and if you know these four, then you kind of uh, will see most other process models as being some, some variant of them. Okay, um, so a software process model is nothing more than just a description of how you work and what tools you're using and what techniques you're applying in order to develop software. And if we do this correctly, then given the team and the customer requirements, um, you should be able to develop, satisfy their, their needs with a relatively low cost and, uh, you know, with relatively good quality. Okay, so when people hear software process, oftentimes they think, ah, oh, you know, I don't need to worry about that because I'm really small or I'm too busy or blah, blah, blah. But really, you know, by de whenever you develop software, you are using some kind of process. Okay, it may not be documented, it may not be consistent, it may not be very good, um, but you are doing something. Okay, so the goal of this uh, screencast is to give you a sense for some of the practices that have emerged over time with the hope that the next time you find yourself in trouble on a project, you'll think to yourself, maybe there's a different way to organize my work practices so that I can, uh, you know, work better. Okay, um, and that's what all the text on this slide is essentially saying. <laughs> okay, um, so how do we? How do I suggest that you create your own software process? I think you should start with a fairly minimal set of work practices, tools, and techniques, at least if you're working in a small project on a non-life critical system. And then you start developing, but you pay close attention to the ways in which things are working and the ways in which they're not, and then make changes to your work practices, tools, and techniques um, to, to address those problems that occur. Because really, you know, the, the best kind of process is extremely contextual. It depends upon the people that you work with and the work environment you're in and the customers that you have and so forth. So, um, you know, it's rarely that you can just kind of unpack a, you know, a process from some book or some website and, and, and apply it, uh, you know, in the vanilla way and have it work great, okay? So there, um, if, you, if we think about, you know, software development since the 60s in, uh, in the beginning, the emphasis was actually on development of hardware and software was seen as kind of a minor aspect of the overall, uh, you know, problem of building computers. And so there wasn't much structure for software development at that time. The first real um, breakthrough in thinking about how to develop software in a methodical way came in the 70s and it was dubbed the waterfall model. Um, that worked okay, but then people started to see that there were pr times when that process didn't really fit the way things were happening in practice. And so there were various um, uh, changes to the, that waterfall model. The pro there's a, a kind of a prototyping type or a spiral model that was developed in the 80s. In the 90s, the uh, capability maturity model was used to try to um, assess an organiz at the organization level what, what kinds of process mechanisms they had in place. And then in the, for the past 10 to 15 years, um, the, the kind of predominant method has been some variant of an agile or lightweight method. So let's look at all those. The waterfall model, the, the very first kind of software process model was this notion that first you develop requirements, given the requirements you develop a design, given the design you develop an implementation. Once you have an implementation you test it and then when it's all tested and, and working correctly then it goes into a maintenance mode. Now this is a highly simplified representation of what the actual waterfall model uh, was back in those days. Even then they realized that there was going to be some iteration among the phases. So it isn't strictly as linear as as uh, this diagram would suggest, but nevertheless, this is you know a good kind of straw man. Okay, the great thing about the waterfall model is that to the extent that you can follow it, it's extremely effective and efficient. Okay, because each stage produces a deliverable, and that deliverable is a great input to the next stage. The problem is when uh, you know those uh, requirements, when the actual initial requirements. <coughs> 
either can't be specified in advance of an implementation or they're just simply volatile over time, then um, you end up having to throw away a great deal of design and implementation and testing work. Okay? Um, so one way to address that problem is, is the notion of prototyping, where if you really don't understand your requirements very well at the beginning, then what you might do is develop a prototype which enables you to kind of show something to the customer uh, and you don't put a lot of energy into the quality of that prototype. You just build it as a way of, of uh, eliciting the requirements for the system and then you throw it away. The problem with this is that once you have a running system, no matter how junky it is, people really don't want to throw it away. You know, I mean, there's a lot of psychological pain and suffering about throwing away something you've, you've put a lot of energy into. But if you start trying to build a reliable system out of a system that wasn't designed to be reliable or, you know, uh, structured correctly from the beginning, you know, that, that can lead to a lot of problems, okay? So uh, in, to overcome some of those, to provide some of the benefits of prototyping but overcome some of those difficulties, Barry Bame at the University of Southern California developed this thing called the spiral model. And the idea is that you kind of go around this loop where um, development is incremental. You set objectives. You perform a risk assessment to figure out, you know, what are the, the big issues that could kind of sink things at this point in development. And once you understand that, you develop uh, the system using an appropriate approach. You know, it could be waterfall. It could be anything. And then uh, at the end of that, you review where you are in the project, set new objectives, get new funding, and, and so forth. And you spin around that as many times as you need to get to the place where you need to be. Here's a more um, kind of uh, uh, a, a better diagram for this process. Okay. So the great thing about the spiral model is that it provides an iterative approach to development, which is still, um, you know, has distinct phases. You, it has risk analysis as a first class part of the development process, which is a great thing because if you understand the risks, you're, you're uh, one huge step closer to avoiding catastrophic failure. The cons of it is that, you know, risk assessment is a skill that needs to be learned, kind of a new thing for many developers. And, you know, this idea that the, the contract has to be awarded in this kind of incremental way where you get funding, you know, renewed funding at various phases, um, you know, that, that pr creates contractual issues for certain kinds of, of organizations. But it's a very successful process model. Okay, so then in the 90s, uh, early 90s, the Department of Defense wanted a way to figure out for various organizations whether they had uh, the prerequisite level of software development expertise uh, that was needed for the various kinds of projects that the DOD wanted to fund. And so they built this thing called the Capability Maturity Model, which was a way of assessing organizations to uh, see how good they were at software development and then you know, reward those or give contracts to those who had a minimum level of, of process maturity. So they defined these five levels. Initial, which is kind of junk. Repeatable meant that basic project management was in place. Defined meant that um, you had kind of uh, you know, levels of, of, of measurements that were available that allowed um, you to kind of well specify what the process was. Management that you were taking those, that data and using it to actually, um, uh, you know, decide how to do management. And at the optimis optimizing level, you're using those measurements to actually improve, predictably improve the, the efficiency of your development process over time. Okay, so um, here's this, uh, you know, an, a, a summary of these various levels. And um, at the, you know, at the early stages, almost everybody was in level one and level two. And now over time, you know, various organizations have gotten to quite high levels of process maturity. So the benefits for that is that if for the first time an organization had some a kind of concrete way to figure out how to get better at defining and following software process models according to best practices. Um, the uh, difficulties with it is that there's a lot of documentation associated with it. Sometimes organizations can follow the letter but not the, the spirit. And finally, for very small organizations, um, it's not entirely clear how this, uh, this would scale down, although I think that they've done a lot of work in this in the, in the, in the recent past. But in contrast, so as the CMM was kind of gaining mindshare in the community, there were groups of developers who 
uh, rebelled against the very kind of top-down, uh, you know, processy um, approach to development, and they um, create the they created this kind of alternative approach to thinking about development called agile development methods, and uh, best known at, like by extreme programming or Scrum are the two that are really the, the most popular these days. And the notion here is that you're going to have very lightweight processes. You're not going to document your process very much. You're going to measure not very much. Um, but you are going to focus on rapid turnaround and extensive iteration with the customer and um, hopefully using modern tools and techniques that allow that iteration to occur without excessive loss in quality. That's kind of the key, the key premise. Um, so with extreme, extreme programming, there are these uh, various, you know, 12 practices that are associated with it. 40-hour um, work week, that kind of sticks out, you know, so no heroic programming. Uh, pair programming is another very, um, you know, kind of radical concept where you have two people working together. And this kind of offsets the need for extensive code reviews because the notion is when you're pair programming, you're reviewing code 100% of the time anyway. So the, the, um, the fundamental premise behind a lot of these Agile methods is that in the past, the notion was that the later you got in the development process, the more expensive it was to make fundamental changes. Um, when you think about the way olden days when people would ship out magnetic tapes and binders full of documentation to their customer every time they made a new release, um, you want to make darn sure that release is, is pretty darn good because to you know ship out a new magnetic tapes and new copies of all the binders, you know that's quite expensive. Okay, um, what the agile people are saying is you know it, it's just not we just aren't using magnetic tapes and binders full of documentation anymore with the internet um, and uh, you know continuous delivery processes. It's in fact quite cheap to make small changes to an existing large system and, and release uh, those changes into production. And so the cost of change is not really, um, you know, uh, you know be the cost of change is not increasing much over time. Okay, so therefore, let's just make change whenever we need to. And so therefore, we don't need to do an extensive upfront requirements analysis phase. We can go just build a system with kind of a preliminary notion of the, of the user's requirements, give them the system, let them give us feedback about how it does or does not satisfy their requirements, and then just change the system. Okay? So uh, their requirements, uh, you know, elicitation process is called user stories, which are, you know, generally on index cards where it talks about you know, two to three sentences about what the customer wants to do. You create a, an acceptance test, which checks to see whether the system actually satisfies that user story. Um, and you can also have unit tests, which check to make sure internal, you know, classes and small scales, uh, you know, abstract data types are working correctly. So between those two things, you have a lot of testing for the system. You have a lot of um, interaction with the customer, and you you know, rapidly and in an agile manner build a system that satisfies their requirements. So um, the pros of agile methods, it's really well suited to small development groups who have easy access to their customers when, uh, you know, the project is under a lot of time constraints and the resulting system is relatively small and presumably not, you know, life critical. Okay. Um, the cons are, you know, if it's a life critical application, you maybe don't want to, you know, kind of just see if the customer is dead or not to figure out whether or not you need to make a change. Okay. So we've gone over four different models, waterfall, spiral, CMM, and agile. Um, I would hope that you would kind of retain a, a, a notion of these process models in your head as you go into future environments. Um, you should be able to think about whether or not one of these canonical types of models would be better or worse to the situation that you find yourself in now. Thanks a lot.